Welcome to Straight to the Point. I'm your host, Representative Joe DiOrsi. In a world of long-windedness, I'm here to deliver you the capital news in 10 minutes or less. So let's get straight to the point. So this is the Straight to the Point podcast. I'm Representative Joe DiOrsi, and in studio today, I'm joined by Keith Williams. He's the Senior Vice President for the Center for Independent Employees. Keith, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So what does CIE do, and what do you do specifically at, at the top of this organization? Sure. CIE is, well, our, our purpose really is to provide a mechanism for employees to hold their unions accountable. And um, in, a, in a lot of ways, that's already done uh, through decisions like uh, the Supreme Court decision, the Janus decision. Um, in the public sector, teachers and other public sector employees can leave a union that doesn't serve their interests. Um, but in a broader sense, they're still represented by that union, even if they choose to leave individually. So what the Center for Independent Employees uh, really does is remove the union entirely in situations where employees want to get rid of that, cast that union out completely. So we're less concerned about the individual per se and more concerned about helping them as a group take collective action against a union that no longer serves them. Yeah, so you mentioned the Janus decision, so that, that was a groundbreaking court case. Um, what, what, what did that find and what does that mean for us here in Pennsylvania? Well, essentially, the idea behind it, and again, I was a high school English teacher for 21 years. I'm not, a, I'm not an attorney, but uh, I'll give it my best crack. Essentially, uh, the decision came down to the fact that, and again, this is public sector unions, that all public sector union money is inherently political because public sector unions bargain with the taxpayer. And because of that, you can't compel someone to subsidize political speech. So you have a, a lobbying group, a political lobbying group, who is forcing you to pay them money even if you don't necessarily want to be represented by them. And the courts essentially said that, no, you can't do that. That's forcing someone to subsidize your political speech is an infringement on their First Amendment rights. Mm -hmm. So it did away with that. So we're at the point now where you know, teachers and other public sector employees can choose not to continue to pay dues. There's a few issues there in that um, I think employee rights are still largely in the dark. You know, we have, if, if you're arrested, you're Mirandized, right? The, the assumption isn't that you already know your rights. The assumption is that you don't know your rights and you need to be told. So yep. I think there's some work to be done there in making sure that employees do know that they have their rights and their options yep. on the table. So in my limited time here in government, I've been, I've been in office for less than 18 months. In my limited time being on the Education Committee and the Labor and Industry Committee, which are committees that are heavy uh, in, in terms of hearing bills that are influenced by labor unions, I don't have a very high opinion of, of, of unions. However, I understand uh, the function of unions, and I understand the original intent. Um, and I can remember, Keith, when I was a kid, a young young kid, uh, my mom was a public school teacher. She was in the union. They, they, they had picketed for uh, better, you know, wages and, and benefits and, mm -hmm. and hours and so forth. Um, I saw that, and in fact, I believe it was, in, in, to a large degree, a, a righteous, you know, fight. But uh, unions, at least with the PSEA, the NEA, ha has seemed to morph into something different entirely. Um, can you kind of talk about the line or the trajectory with, with the, the original intent and just drifting far afield from its original mission? Sure. Well, I, you know, again, I don't know that we have time to go through the whole history of the <laughs> NEA here, but, um, you know, it started off as really a professional guild. It was an association. It was not a union per se. Um, and then with the advent of collective bargaining in the public sector in the 70s, um, it, it, became to, it became more of a traditional union in the sense that, you know, there was collective bargaining now and they basically served as the exclusive bargaining agent um, in the places where they were voted in. So um, once that happened and the relationship changed, um, as they continued to grow, we're at the point now where the NEA is a $1.6 billion corporate, corporate big labor is the phrase I, I like to use. Um, 
they don't necessarily have an interest in representing you know a small rural school district with 30 or 40 teachers um, you know so people get shortchanged um, their their interest really lies in in the federal and the state level lobbying for frankly a lot of things other than wages hours and working conditions and if they stuck to wages hours and working conditions I think you know everybody would be better for it um, they would get a lot more support but that is unfortunately not where we're at these days and they've they've chosen to take a a much further uh, track outside of those those core collective bargaining uh, subjects and they've really alienated a lot of their audience for it yeah so it's it's hard for for me for someone in, from my vantage point as a legislator that's on the education committee speaking of the NEA here to label them not political or apolitical, because I look at campaign contributions, and 99% of their campaign contributions are going to Democrats. Like, what's the the simple answer as to why? I mean, it's kind of rhetorical. Are are they, Democrats are lobbying, or or fighting for for their quote-unquote interests? Right. Well, again, you have to, you have to understand the relationships, right? I mean, you know, I'll say center-right groups typically want to hold down taxes and you know limited government um and then on the other side you want to expand government programs throw money at schools um and you know teachers typically view that as okay if you keep throwing money at schools that's going to trickle into my paycheck but um unfortunately that's just not the reality i mean there's a lot of I mean, we don't have any any way to look at graphics right now, but there's a lot of graphics I could show you that that demonstrate that budgets in school districts are increasing exponentially on the on the side of administrative staff, and you know I'll even I'll even coin a, a union term the unfunded mandates, you know, um, the accountability measures that have been put in place. They've they've cost districts and they've added overhead at the administrative level, and so even when you're throwing money at districts, it doesn't necessarily make it to the teachers. And that's, that's a problem. When so. increasingly so, it's, it's making its way to new positions, like administrators or support staff. Is, is, uh, I, I read a data set recently that new hires in those areas have now reached pace with teachers, which is an amazing step. Right, right. Um, so you, you, did some, you used to be a school teacher. Yep. And you did something very unique in your school district. In fact, I think you were the first. Were you the first in the in the state, the nation, to accomplish this? As far as anybody knows, it had never been done before. (laughs) And I I didn't realize it was a big deal, of course. You know, I'm just a high school English teacher from a, you know, rural, semi-suburban school district. And um, essentially what happened, I'll see if I can if I can abbreviate this. Uh, We were two years into a four year contract. The board went to the union and said hey would you be willing to renegotiate the remaining two years union agreed to an MOU Uh, this was going into the run-up to uh, Governor Wolf's first term and so there was a lot of political money flying around our district was one of about 30 where non-union members were still not forced to pay a fee uh, for the representation that's what we used to call an agency fee or a fair share fee Um, And so when this MOU came up, the state union, the PSEA and National are are looking at these, you know, 30 or so remaining districts where they're not forcing uh, non-union members to pay. And they went, hey, like you just opened up your contract and uh, you've got about 45 teachers here that aren't aren't paying anything. They're not paying their fair share. And so with one line item in the MOU, they were able to extract about $21,000 a year from non-union members. And we learned about this through an email that went out uh, from the union leadership to the non-union teachers. And the mistake there, as I always say, they, they carbon copied everybody, they forgot to blind copy us, and I was the reply all guy. So long story short, we pushed back and we became the only district where they removed the agency fee provision once they had negotiated it in. So usually once it was in, it, it it, again, it took a Supreme Court case in 2018 to finally remove it entirely from, you know, from any school district. But uh, in our in our case, uh, the local union saw the error of their ways and realized that hey, 
it's you know maybe not a good idea to extort money from your colleagues that you have to work with every day. Yeah. So, so lightning round question here, Keith. Uh, and I, I know a lot of teachers, and and they're often looking for alternatives to the traditional union. Um, but there's a lot of scare ta- ca- tactics. There's a lot of fallacies. Um, what would you want teachers across this state to know as it relates to their options with union membership? I think they need to realize there's a lot of options. Um, there are state-based uh, C6 associations that can provide liability insurance. Uh, you have the Keystone Teachers Association uh, was one such group. Uh, you have the Association of American Educators, which is a national group. They're another one. Um, so they can provide that liability insurance. But I also think you know a lot of times teachers want to have somebody right there if they're on the hot seat or they've got an administrator who has it out for them or you know a crazy parent or a crazy school board member. Um, you know, and in those cases, I think it's worth a discussion about a paradigm shift toward independent local unions. Um, we've done about 40 of those in seven states right now. We just did two more in Kansas where teachers vote out the NEA affiliate and they create their own independent local. So it's really the buy, buy local movement of labor, and it allows them to keep their money local, keep their decision making local, and stay completely apolitical. So it's really a great option. That sounds pretty sensible to me. (laughs) So he is Keith Williams. He's the Senior Vice President for the Center for Independent Employees. Keith, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Joe. This has been Straight to the Point. Visit repjod.com slash mypodcasts.